Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter sixteen. Dr. Seward's Diary Continued. It was just a quarter before twelve o'clock when we got into the churchyard over the low wall. The night was dark, with occasional gleams of moonlight between the dents of the heavy clouds that scudded across the sky. We all kept somehow close together, with Van Helsing slightly in front as he led the way. When we had come close to the tomb, I looked well at Arthur, for I feared the proximity to a place laden with so sorrowful a memory would upset him. But he bore himself well. I took it that the very mystery of the proceeding was in some way a counteractant to his grief. The professor unlocked the door, and seeing a natural hesitation amongst us, for various reasons, solved the difficulty by entering first himself. The rest of us followed, and he closed the door. He then lit a dark lantern, and pointed to a coffin. Arthur stepped forward hesitatingly. Van Helsing said to me, "'You were here with me yesterday. "'Was the body of Miss Lucy in that coffin?' "'It was.' "'The professor turned to the rest, saying, "'You hear, and yet there is no one who does not believe with me.' "'He took his screwdriver, and again took off the lid of the coffin. "'Arthur looked on, very pale but silent. "'When the lid was removed,' He stepped forward. He evidently did not know that there was a leaden coffin, or at any rate had not thought of it. When he saw the rent in the lead, the blood rushed to his face for an instant, but as quickly fell away again, so that he remained of a ghastly whiteness. He was still silent. Van Helsing forced back the leaden flange, and we all looked in, and recoiled. The coffin was empty. For several minutes no one spoke a word. The silence was broken by Quincy Morris. Professor, I answered for you. Your word is all I want. I wouldn't ask such a thing. Ordinarily, I wouldn't so dishonor you as to imply a doubt. But this is a mystery that goes beyond any honor or dishonor. Is this your doing? I swear to you by all that I hold sacred that I have not removed or touched her. What happened was this. Two nights ago my friend Seward and I came here with good purpose, believe me. I opened that coffin, which was then sealed up, and we found it as it is now, empty. We then waited, and saw something white come through the trees. The next day we came here in daytime, and she lay there. Did she not, friend John? Yes. That night we were just in time. One more so small child was missing, and we find it, thank God, unharmed amongst the graves. Yesterday I came here before sundown, for at sundown the undead can move. I waited here all night till the sun rose, but I saw nothing. It was most probable that it was because I had laid over the clamps of those doors garlic, which the undead cannot bear, and other things which they shun. Last night there was no exodus, so to-night before the sundown, I took away my garlic and other things, and so it is we find this coffin empty. But bear with me. So far there is much that is strange. Wait you with me outside, unseen and unheard, and things much stranger are yet to be. So... Here he shut the dark slide of his lantern. Now, to the outside. He opened the door, and we filed out. 
he coming last, and locking the door behind him. Oh, but it seemed fresh and pure in the night air, after the terror of that vault. How sweet it was to see the clouds race by, and the passing gleams of the moonlight between the scudding clouds crossing and passing, like the gladness and sorrow of a man's life. How sweet it was to breathe the fresh air that had no taint of death and decay. How humanizing to see the red lighting of the sky beyond the hill, and to hear far away the muffled roar that marks the life of a great city. Each in his own way was solemn and overcome. Arthur was silent and was, I could see, striving to grasp the purpose and the inner meaning of the mystery. I was myself tolerably patient, and half inclined again to throw aside doubt and to accept Van Helsing's conclusions. Quincy Morris was phlegmatic in the way of a man who accepts all things, and accepts them in the spirit of cool bravery, with hazard of all he has at stake. Not being able to smoke, he cut himself a good-sized plug of tobacco, and began to chew. As to Van Helsing, he was employed in a definite way. First he took from his bag a mass of what looked like thin, wafer-like biscuit, which was carefully rolled up in a white napkin. Next he took out a double handful of some whitish stuff, like dough or putty. He crumbled the wafer up fine, and worked it into the mass between his hands. This he then took, and rolling it into thin strips, began to lay them into the crevices between the door and its setting in the tomb. I was somewhat puzzled at this, and being close, asked him what it was that he was doing. Arthur and Quincy drew near also, as they too were curious. He answered, I am closing the tomb so that the undead may not enter. And is that stuff you have there going to do it? It is. What is that which you are using? This time the question was by Arthur. Van Helsing reverently lifted his hat as he answered, The host. I brought it from Amsterdam. I have an indulgence. It was an answer that appalled the most skeptical of us, and we felt individually that in the presence of such earnest purpose as the professor's, a purpose which could thus use the, to him, most sacred things, it was impossible to distrust. In respectful silence we took the places assigned to us close round the tomb, but hidden from the sight of any one approaching. I pitied the others, especially Arthur. I had myself been apprenticed by my former visits to this watching horror, and yet I, who had up to an hour ago repudiated the proofs, felt my heart sink within me. Never did tombs look so ghastly white. Never did cypress or yew or juniper so seem the embodiment of funeral gloom. Never did tree or grass wave or rustle so ominously. Never did bough creak so mysteriously, and never did the far-away howling of dogs send such a woeful presage through the night. There was a long spell of silence, big, aching, void, and then from the professor a keen he pointed, and far down the avenue of yews we saw a white figure advance, a dim white figure, which held something dark at its breast. The figure stopped, and at the moment a ray of moonlight fell upon the masses of driving clouds, and showed, in startling prominence, a dark-haired woman, 
dressed in the cerements of the grave. We could not see the face, for it was bent down over what we saw to be a fair-haired child. There was a pause, and a sharp little cry, such as a child gives in sleep, or a dog as it lies before the fire and dreams. We were starting forward, but the professor's warning hand, seen by us as he stood behind a yew-tree, kept us back. And then, as we looked, the white figure moved forwards again. It was now near enough for us to see clearly, and the moonlight still held. My own heart grew cold as ice, and I could hear the gasp of Arthur, as we recognized the features of Lucy Westenra. Lucy Westenra, but yet how changed! The sweetness was turned to adamantine, heartless cruelty, and the purity to voluptuous wantonness. Van Helsing stepped out, and obedient to his gesture, we all advanced too. The four of us ranged in a line before the door of the tomb. Van Helsing raised his lantern and drew the slide. By the concentrated light that fell on Lucy's face, we could see that the lips were crimson with fresh blood, and that the stream had trickled over her chin and stained the purity of her own death-robe. We shuddered with horror. I could see by the tremulous light that even Van Helsing's iron nerve had failed. Arthur was next to me, and if I had not seized his arm and held him up, he would have fallen. When Lucy, I call the thing that was before us Lucy because it bore her shape, saw us, she drew back with an angry snarl such as a cat gives when taken unawares. Then her eyes ranged over us, Lucy's eyes in form and color, but Lucy's eyes unclean and full of hell-fire, instead of the pure, gentle orbs we knew. At the moment the remnant of my love passed into hate and loathing. Had she then to be killed, I could have done it with savage delight. As she looked, her eyes blazed with unholy light, and the face became wreathed with a voluptuous smile. Oh, God, how it made me shudder to see it! With a careless motion, she flung to the ground, callous as a devil, the child that up to now she had clutched strenuously to her breast, growling over it as a dog growls over a bone. The child gave a sharp cry, and lay there moaning. There was a cold bloodedness in the act, which wrung a groan from Arthur. When she advanced to him with outstretched arms and a wanton smile, he fell back and hid his face in his hands. Still she advanced, however, and with a languorous, voluptuous grace, said, Come to me, Arthur. Leave these others, and come to me. My arms are hungry for you. Come, and we can rest together. Come, my husband, Come. There was something diabolically sweet in her tones, something of the tinkling of glass when struck, which rang through the brains even of us who heard the words addressed to another. As for Arthur, he seemed under a spell. Moving his hands from his face, he opened wide his arms. She was leaping for them, when Van Helsing sprang forward and held between them his little golden crucifix. She recoiled from it, 
and, with a sudden, distorted face, full of rage, dashed past him, as if to enter the tomb. When, within a foot or two of the door, however, she stopped, as if arrested by some irresistible force. Then she turned, and her face was shown in the clear burst of moonlight, and by the lamp, which had now no quiver from Van Helsing's nerves. Never did I see such baffled malice on a face, and never, I trust, shall such ever be seen again by mortal eyes. The beautiful color became livid, the eyes seemed to throw out sparks of hell-fire, the brows were wrinkled as though the folds of flesh were the coils of Medusa's snakes, and the lovely, blood-stained mouth grew to an open square, as in the passion masts of the Greeks and Japanese. If ever a face meant death, if looks could kill, we saw it at that moment. And so for full half a minute, which seemed an eternity, she remained between the lifted crucifix and the sacred closing of her means of entry. Van Helsing broke the silence by asking Arthur, Answer me, my friend. Am I to proceed in my work? Do as you will, friend. Do as you will. There can be no horror like this ever any more and he groaned in spirit. Quincy and I simultaneously moved towards him, and took his arms. We could hear the click of the closing lantern as Van Helsing held it down. Coming close to the tomb, he began to remove from the chinks some of the sacred emblem which he had placed there. We all looked with horrified amazement, as we saw when he stood back, the woman, with a corporeal body as real as that moment as our own, passed through the interstice, where scarce a knife-blade could have gone. We all felt a glad sense of relief when we saw the professor calmly restoring the strings of putty to the edges of the door. When this was done, he lifted the child and said, "'Come now, my friends,' We can do no more till to-morrow. There is a funeral at noon, so here we shall all come before long after that. The friends of the dead shall be gone by two, and when the sexton locks the gate, we shall remain. Then there is more to do, but not like this of to-night. As for this little one, he is not much harmed, and by to-morrow night he shall be well. We shall leave him where the police will find him, as on the other night, and then to home. Coming close to Arthur, he said, My friend Arthur, you have had a sore trial, but after, when you look back, you will see how it was necessary. You are now in the bitter waters, my child, by this time to-morrow you will, please God, have passed them, and have drunk of the sweet waters. We do not mourn over much. Till then I shall not ask you to forgive me. Arthur and Quincy came home with me, and we tried to cheer each other on the way. We had left behind the child in safety, and were tired. So we all slept with more or less reality of sleep. 29 September Night A little before twelve o'clock, we three, Arthur, Quincy, Morris, and myself, called for the professor. It was odd to notice that, by common consent, we had all put on black clothes. Of course, Arthur wore black, for he was in deep mourning. But the rest of us wore it by instinct. We got to the graveyard by half-past one, and strolled about, 
keeping out of official observation, so that when the grave-diggers had completed their task, and the sexton, under the belief that every one had gone, had locked the gate, we had the place all to ourselves. Van Helsing, instead of his little black bag, had with him a long leather one, something like a cricketing bag. It was manifestly of fair weight. When we were alone, and had heard the last of the footsteps die out up the road, we silently, and as if by ordered intention, followed the professor to the tomb. He unlocked the door, and we entered, closing it behind us. Then he took from his bag the lantern, which he lit, and also two wax candles, which, when lighted, he stuck by melting their own ends on the other coffins, so that they might give light sufficient to work by. When he again lifted the lid off Lucy's coffin, we all looked, Arthur, trembling like an aspen, and saw that the corpse lay there in all its death beauty. But there was no love in my own heart, nothing but loathing for the foul thing which had taken Lucy's shape without her soul. I could even see Arthur's face grow hard as he looked. Presently he said to Van Helsing, Is this really Lucy's body, or only a demon in her shape? It is her body, and yet not it. But wait a while, and you shall see her as she was and is. She seemed like a nightmare of Lucy as she lay there. The pointed teeth, the blood-stained voluptuous mouth, which made one shudder to see, the whole carnal and unspirited appearance, something like a devilish mockery of Lucy's sweet purity. Van Helsing, with his usual methodicalness, began taking the various contents from his bag, and placing them ready for use. First he took out a soldering iron, and some plumbing solder, and then small oil lamp, which gave out, when lit in a corner of the tomb, gas, which burned at a fierce heat, with a blue flame. Then his operating knives, which he placed to hand, and last a round wooden stake, some two and a half or three inches thick, and about three feet long. One end of it was hardened by charring in the fire, and was sharpened to a fine point. With this stake came a heavy hammer, such as in households is used in the coal cellar for breaking the lumps. To me, a doctor's preparations for work of any kind are stimulating and bracing, but the effect of these things on both Arthur and Quincy was to cause them a sort of consternation. They both, however, kept their courage, and remained silent and quiet. When all was ready, Van Helsing said, Before we do anything, let me tell you this. It is out of the lore and experience of the ancients, and of all those who have studied the powers of the undead. When they become such, there comes, with the change, the curse of immortality. They cannot die, but must go on age after age, adding new victims, and multiplying the evils of the world. For all that die from the praying of the undead becomes themselves undead, and prey on their kind. And so the circle goes on ever widening, like as the ripples from a stone thrown in the water. Friend, Arthur, if you had met that kiss which you know of before 
poor Lucy die, or again last night when you open your arms to her, you would, in time, when you had died, become Nosferatu, as they call it in Eastern Europe, and would for all time make more of those undeads that so have filled us with horror. The career of this so unhappy dear lady is but just begun. Those children whose blood she sucked are not as yet so much the worse, but if she lives on undead, more and more they lose their blood, and by her power over them they come to her, and so she draw their blood with that so wicked mouth. But if she die in truth, then all cease. The tiny wounds of the throats disappear, and they go back to their play, unknowing ever of what has been. But of the most blessed of all, when this now undead be made to rest as true dead, then the soul of the poor lady whom we love shall again be free. Instead of working wickedness by night, and growing more debased in the assimilating of it by day, she shall take her place with the other angels, so that, my friend, it will be a blessed hand for her that shall strike the blow that sets her free. To this I am willing, but there is none amongst us who has a better right. Will it be no joy to think of hereafter, in the silence of the night when sleep is not, it was my hand that sent her to the stars, it was the hand of him that loved her best, the hand that of all she would herself have chosen, had it been to her to choose. Tell me, if there be such a one amongst us. We all looked at Arthur. He saw, too, what we all did, the infinite kindness which suggested that his should be the hand which would restore Lucy to us as a holy and not an unholy memory. He stepped forward and said bravely, though his hand trembled, and his face was as pale as snow. My true friend, from the bottom of my broken heart, I thank you. Tell me what I am to do, and I shall not falter. Van Helsing laid a hand on his shoulder and said, Brave lad, a moment's courage, and it is done. This stake must be driven through her. It will be a fearful ordeal, be not deceived in that, but it will be only a short time, and you will then rejoice more than your pain was great. From this grim tomb you will emerge as though you tread on air, but you must not falter when once you have begun. Only think that we, your true friends, are round you, and that we pray for you all the time. Go on, Arthur said hoarsely. Tell me what I am to do. Take the stake in your left hand, ready to place it to the point over the heart, and the hammer in your right. Then, when we begin our prayer for the dead, I shall read him. I have here the book, and the others shall follow. Strike, in God's name, that so all may be well with the dead that we love, and that the undead pass away. Arthur took the stake and the hammer, and when once his mind was set on action, his hands never trembled, nor even quivered. Van Helsing opened his missile and began to read, and Quincy and I followed as well as we could. Arthur placed the point over the heart, and as I looked I could see its dent in the white flesh. Then he struck with 
all his might. The thing in the coffin writhed, and a hideous blood-curdling screech came from the opened red lips. The body shook and quivered, and twisted in wild contortions. The sharp white teeth clamped together till the lips were cut, and the mouth was smeared with a crimson foam. But Arthur never faltered. He looked like a figure of Thor, as his untrembling arm rose and fell, driving deeper and deeper the mercy-bearing stake, whilst the blood from the pierced heart welled and spurted up around it. His face was set, and high duty seemed to shine through it. The sight of it gave us courage, so that our voices seemed to ring through the little vault. And then the writhing and quivering of the body became less, and the teeth seemed to champ, and the face to quiver. Finally it lay still. The terrible task was over. The hammer fell from Arthur's hand. He reeled and would have fallen had we not caught him. The great drops of sweat sprang from his forehead, and his breath came in broken gasps. It had indeed been an awful strain on him, and had he not been forced to his task by more than human considerations, he could never have gone through with it. For a few minutes we were so taken up with him that we did not look towards the coffin. When we did, however, a murmur of startled surprise ran from one to the other of us, we gazed so eagerly that Arthur rose, for he had been seated on the ground, and came and looked too, and then a glad, strange light broke over his face, and dispelled altogether the gloom of horror that lay upon it. There, in the coffin, lay no longer the foul thing that we had so dreaded and grown to hate that the work of her destruction was yielded as a privilege to the one best entitled to it. But Lucy, as we had seen her in life, with her face of unequalled sweetness and purity, true that there were there, as we had seen them in life, the traces of care and pain and waste. But these were all dear to us, for they marked her truth to what we knew. One and all we felt that the holy calm that lay like sunshine over the wasted face and form was only an earthly token and symbol of the calm that was to reign for ever. Van Helsing came and laid his hand on Arthur's shoulder and said to him, And now, Arthur, my friend, dear lad, am I not forgiven? The reaction of the terrible strain came as he took the old man's hand in his, and raising it to his lips, pressed it, and said, Forgiven, God bless you that you have given my dear one her soul again, and me peace. He put his hands on the professor's shoulder, and laying his head on his breast, cried for a while, silently whilst we stood unmoving. When he raised his head, Van Helsing said to him, And now, my child, you may kiss her. Kiss her dead lips, if you will, as she would have you to, if for her to choose. For she is not a grinning devil now, not any more a foul thing for all eternity. No longer she is the devil's undead. She is God's true dead, whose soul is with him. Arthur bent and kissed her, and then we sent him and Quincy out of the tomb. The professor and I sawed the top off the stake, leaving the point of it in the body. Then we cut off the head and filled the mouth with garlic. 
we soldered up the leaden coffin, screwed on the coffin lid, and gathering up our belongings, came away. When the professor locked the door, he gave the key to Arthur. Outside the air was sweet, the sun shone, and the bird sang, and it seemed as if all nature were tuned to a different pitch. There was gladness and mirth and peace everywhere, for we were at rest ourselves on one account, and we were glad, though it was with a tempered joy. Before we moved away, Van Helsing said, Now, my friends, one step of our work is done, one the most harrowing to ourselves, but there remains a greater task, to find out the author of all this our sorrow, and to stamp him out. I have clues which we can follow, but it is a long task, and a difficult one, and there is danger in it, and pain. Shall you not all help me? We have learned to believe all of us, is it not so? And since so, do we not see our duty? Yes, and do we not promise to go on to the bitter end? Each in turn we took his hand, and the promise was made. Then said the professor as we moved off, Two nights hence you shall meet with me, and dine together at seven of the clock with friend John. I shall entreat two others, two that you know not as yet, and I shall be ready to all our work show, and our plans unfold. Friend John, you come with me home, for I have much to consult you about, and you can help me. To-night I leave for Amsterdam, but shall return to-morrow night, and then begins our great quest. But first I shall have much to say, so that you may know what to do, and to dread. Then our promise shall be made to each other anew, for this is a terrible task before us, and once our feet are on the ploughshare, we must not draw back. End of chapter 16「Dracula » by Bram Stoker Chapter 17 Dr. Seward's Diary Continued When we arrived at the Barclay Hotel, Van Helsing found a telegram waiting for him. "'Am coming up by train. Jonathan at Whitby. Important news. Nina Harker. The professor was delighted. "'Ah, that wonderful Madame Mina!' he said. Pearl among women. She arrived, but I cannot stay. She must go to your house, friend John. You must meet her at the station. Telegraph her en route, so that she may be prepared. When the wire was dispatched, he had a cup of tea. Over it he told me of a diary kept by Jonathan Harker when abroad and gave me a typewritten copy of it, as also of Mrs. Harker's diary at Whitby. Take these, he said, and study them well. When I have returned, you will be master of all the facts, and we can then better enter on our inquisition. Keep them safe, for there is in them much of treasure. You will need all your faith, even you who have had such an experience as that of to-day. What is here told? He laid his hand heavily and gravely on the packet of papers as he spoke. May be the beginning of the end to you and me, and many another, or it may sound the knell of the undead who walk the earth. Read all, I pray you, with the open mind, 
and if you can add in any way to the story here told, do so, for it is all important. You have kept a diary of all these so strange things. Is it not so? Yes, then we shall go through all these together when we meet. He then made ready for his departure, and shortly drove off to Liverpool Street. I took my way to Paddington, where I arrived about fifteen minutes before the train came in. The crowd melted away, after the bustling fashion common to arrival platforms, and I was beginning to feel uneasy, lest I might miss my guest, when a sweet-faced, dainty-looking girl stepped up to me, and after a quick glance said, "'Dr. Seward, is it not?' "'Ah, and you are Mrs. Harker,' I answered at once, whereupon she held out her hand. "'I knew you from the description of poor dear Lucy, but—' She stopped suddenly, and a quick blush overspread her face. The blush that rose to my own cheeks somehow set us both at ease, for it was a tacit answer to her own. I got her luggage, which included a typewriter, and we took the underground to Fenchurch Street, after I had sent a wire to my housekeeper to have a sitting-room and a bedroom prepared at once for Mrs. Harker. In due time we arrived. She knew, of course, that the place was a lunatic asylum, but I could see that she was unable to repress a shudder when we entered. She told me that, if she might, she would come presently to my study, as she had much to say. So here I am finishing my entry in my phonograph diary, whilst I await her. As yet I have not had the chance of looking at the papers which Van Helsing left with me, though they lie open before me. I must get her interested in something, so that I may have an opportunity of reading them. She does not know how precious time is, or what a task we have in hand. I must be careful not to frighten her. Here she is. Mina Harker's Journal 29th September. After I had tidied myself, I went down to Dr. Seward's study. At the door I paused a moment, for I thought I heard him talking with some one. As, however, he had pressed me to be quick, I knocked at the door, and on his calling out, Come in, I entered. To my intense surprise there was no one with him. He was quite alone, and on the table opposite him was what I knew at once from the description to be a phonograph. I had never seen one, and was much interested. "'I hope I did not keep you waiting,' I said, but I stayed at the door as I heard you talking, and thought there was someone with you. "'Oh,' he replied with a smile, "'I was only entering my diary.' "'Your diary?' I asked him in surprise. "'Yes,' he answered. "'I keep it in this.' As he spoke, he laid his hand on the phonograph. I felt quite excited over it, and blurted out, "'Why, this beats even shorthand! May I hear it say something?' "'Certainly,' he replied with alacrity, and stood up to put it in train for speaking. Then he paused, and a troubled look overspread his face. "'The fact is,' he began awkwardly, "'I only keep my diary in it, and as it is entirely, almost entirely, about my cases, it may be awkward. That is, I mean—' He stopped, and I tried to help him out of his embarrassment. "'You helped to attend dear Lucy at the end. Let me hear how she died. For all that I know of her, I shall be very grateful. She was very, very dear to me.' To my surprise, he answered with a horror-struck look in his face, "'Tell you of her death! Not for the wide world!' "'Why not?' I asked, for some grave, terrible feeling was coming over me. Again he paused, and I could see that he was trying to invent an excuse. At length he stammered out, "'You see, I do not know how to pick out any particular part of the diary.' Even while he was speaking, an idea dawned upon him, and he said with unconscious simplicity, in a different voice, and with the naivete of a child, "'That's quite true, upon my honour. Honest Indian.' 
I could not but smile, at which he grimaced. I gave myself away that time, he said. But do you know that, although I have kept the diary for months past, it never once struck me how I was going to find any particular part of it in case I wanted to look it up? By this time my mind was made up that the diary of a doctor who attended Lucy might have something to add to the sum of our knowledge of that terrible being, and I said boldly, "'Then, Dr. Seward, you had better let me copy it out for you on my typewriter.' He grew to a positively deathly pallor as he said, "'No, no, no, for all the world! I wouldn't let you know that terrible story!' Then it was terrible. My intuition was right. For a moment, I thought, and as my eyes ranged the room, unconsciously looking for something or some opportunity to aid me, they lit on a great batch of typewriting on the table. His eyes caught the look in mine, and without his thinking followed their direction. As they saw the parcel, he realized my meaning. "'You do not know me,' I said. "'When you have read those papers, my own diary, and my husband's also, which I have typed, you will know me better.' I have not faltered in giving every thought of my own heart in this cause. But of course you do not know me yet, and I must not expect you to trust me so far." He is certainly a man of noble nature. Poor dear Lucy was right about him. He stood up and opened a large drawer, in which were ranged in order a number of hollow cylinders of metal covered with dark wax, and said, "'You are quite right. I did not trust you because I did not know you. But I know you now and let me say that I should have known you long ago. I know that Lucy told you of me. She told me of you, too. May I make the only atonement in my power? Take the cylinders and hear them. The first half-dozen of them are personal to me, and they will not horrify you. Then you will know me better. Dinner will by then be ready. In the meantime I shall read over some of these documents, and shall be better able to understand certain things." He carried the phonograph himself up to my sitting-room and adjusted it for me. Now I shall learn something pleasant, I am sure, for it will tell me the other side of a true love episode of which I know one side already. Dr. Seward's Diary, 29 September I was so absorbed in that wonderful diary of Jonathan Harker, and that other of his wife, that I let the time run on without thinking. Mrs. Harker was not down when the maid came to announce dinner, so I said, she is possibly tired. Let dinner wait an hour. And I went on with my work. I had just finished Mrs. Harker's diary when she came in. She looked sweetly pretty, but very sad, and her eyes were flushed with crying. This somehow moved me much. Of late I have had cause for tears, God knows but the relief of them was denied me, and now the sight of those sweet eyes, brightened by recent tears, went straight to my heart. So I said as gently as I could, I greatly fear I have distressed you. Oh, no, not distressed me, she replied, but I have been more touched than I can say by your grief. This is a wonderful machine, but it is cruelly true. It told me, in its very tones, the anguish of your heart. It was like a soul crying out to Almighty God. No one must hear them spoken ever again. See, I have tried to be useful. I have copied out the words on my typewriter, and none other need now hear your heart beat as I did. No one need ever know, shall ever know, I said in a low voice. She laid her hand on mine, and said very gravely, Ah, but they must. Must? But why? I asked. Because it is a part of the terrible story, a part of poor Lucy's death, and all that led to it. Because in the struggle which we have before us to rid the earth of this terrible monster, we must have all the knowledge and all the help which we can get. I think that the cylinders which you gave me contained more than you intended me to know. But I can see that there are in your record many lights to this dark mystery. 
you will let me help will you not i know all up to a certain point and i see already though your diary only took me to seven september how poor lucy was beset and how her terrible doom was being wrought out jonathan and i have been working day and night since professor van helsing saw us he has gone to whitby to get more information and he will be here to-morrow to help us we need have no secrets amongst us working together and with absolute trust we can surely be stronger than if some of us were in the dark she looked at me so appealingly and at the same time manifested such courage and resolution in her bearing that i gave in at once to her wishes you shall i said do as you like in the matter god forgive me if i do wrong there are terrible things yet to learn of but if you have so far travelled on the road to poor lucy's death you will not be content i know to remain in the dark nay the end the very end may give you a gleam of peace come there is dinner we must keep one another strong for what is before us we have a cruel and dreadful task when you have eaten you shall learn the rest and i shall answer any questions you ask if there be anything which you do not understand though it was apparent to us who were present mina harker's journal twenty ninth september after dinner i came with dr seward to his study he brought back the phonograph from my room and i took a chair and arranged the phonograph so that i could touch it without getting up and showed me how to stop it in case i should want to pause then he very thoughtfully took a chair with his back to me so that i might be as free as possible and began to read i put the forked metal to my ears and listened when the terrible story of lucy's death and all that followed was done i lay back in my chair powerless fortunately i am not of a fainting disposition when dr seward saw me he jumped up with a horrified exclamation and hurriedly taking a case bottle from the cupboard gave me some brandy which in a few minutes somewhat restored me my brain was all in a whirl and only that there came through all the multitude of horrors the holy ray of light that my dear lucy was at last at peace i do not think i could have borne it without making a scene it is all so wild and mysterious and strange that if i had not known jonathan's experience in transylvania i could not have believed as it was i didn't know what to believe and so got out of my difficulty by attending to something else i took the cover off my typewriter and said to dr seward let me write this all out now we must be ready for dr van helsing when he comes i have sent a telegram to jonathan to come on here when he arrives in london from whitby in this matter dates are everything and i think that if we get all of our material ready and have every item put in chronological order we shall have done much you tell me that lord godalming and mr morris are coming too let us be able to tell them when they come he accordingly set the phonograph at a slow pace and i began to typewrite from the beginning of the seventeenth cylinder i used manifold and so took three copies of the diary just as i had done with the rest it was late when i got through but dr seward went about his work of going his round of the patients when he had finished he came back and sat near me reading so that i did not feel too lonely whilst i worked how good and thoughtful he is the world seems full of good men even if there are monsters in it before i left him i remembered what jonathan put in his diary of the professor's perturbation at reading something in an evening paper at the station at exeter so seeing that dr seward keeps his newspapers i borrowed the files of the westminster gazette and the pall mall gazette and took them to my room i remember how much the daily graph and the whitby gazette of which i had made cuttings had helped us to understand the terrible events at whitby when count dracula landed so i shall look through the evening papers since then and perhaps i shall get some new light i am not sleepy and the work will help to keep me quiet dr seward's diary thirty september mr harker arrived at nine o'clock he got his wife's wire just before starting he is uncommonly clever 
if one can judge from his face, and full of energy. If this journal be true, and judging by one's own wonderful experiences it must be, he is also a man of great nerve. That going down to the vault a second time was a remarkable piece of daring. After reading his account, I was prepared to meet a good specimen of manhood, but hardly the quiet, business-like gentleman who came here to-day. Later. After lunch, Harker and his wife went back to their own room, and, as I passed a while ago, I heard the click of the typewriter. They are hard at it. Mrs. Harker says that they are knitting together in chronological order every scrap of evidence they have. Harker has got the letters between the consigne of the boxes at Whitby, and the carriers in London who took charge of them. He is now reading his wife's transcript of my diary. I wonder what they make out of it. Here it is. Strange that it never struck me that the very next house might be the Count's hiding-place. Goodness knows we had enough clues from the conduct of the patient Renfield. The bundle of letters relating to the purchase of the house were with the transcript. Oh, if we had only had them earlier, we might have saved poor Lucy. Oh, stop! That way madness lies. Harker has gone back and is again collecting material. He says that by dinner-time they will be able to show a whole connected narrative. He thinks that in the meantime I should see Renfield, as hitherto he has been a sort of index to the coming and going of the Count. I hardly see this yet, but when I get at the dates I suppose I shall. What a good thing that Mrs. Harker put my cylinders into type. We never could have found the dates otherwise. I found Renfield sitting placidly in his room, with his hands folded, smiling benignly. At the moment he seemed as sane as any one I ever saw. I sat down and talked with him on a lot of subjects, all of which he treated naturally. He then, of his own accord, spoke of going home, a subject he has never mentioned, to my knowledge, during his sojourn here. In fact, he spoke quite confidently of getting his discharge at once. I believe that, had I not had the chat with Harker, and read the letters and the dates of his outbursts, I should have been prepared to sign for him, after a brief time of observation. As it is, I am darkly suspicious. All those outbreaks were in some way linked with the proximity of the Count. What then does this absolute content mean? Can it be that his instinct is satisfied as to the vampire's ultimate triumph? Stay! He is himself Zophagus, and in his wild ravings, outside the chapel door of the deserted house, he always spoke of Master. This all seems confirmation of our idea. However, after a while I came away. My friend is just a little too sane at present to make it safe to probe him too deep with questions. He might begin to think, and then... So I came away. I mistrust these quiet moods of his, so I have given the attendant a hint to look after him, and to have a straight waistcoat ready in case of need. Jonathan Harker's Journal 29 September, in train to London when I received Mr. Billington's courteous message that he would give me any information in his power, I thought it best to go down to Whitby and make, on the spot, such inquiries as I wanted. 
it was now my object to trace that horrid cargo of the counts to its place in london later we may be able to deal with it billington junior a nice lad met me at the station and brought me to his father's house where they had decided that i must spend the night they are hospitable with true yorkshire hospitality give a guest everything and leave him to do as he likes they all knew that i was busy and that my stay was short and mr billington had ready in his office all the papers concerning the consignment of boxes it gave me almost a turn to see again one of the letters which i had seen on the count's table before i knew of his diabolical plans everything had been carefully thought out and done systematically and with precision he seemed to have been prepared for every obstacle which might be placed by accident in the way of his intentions being carried out to use an americanism he had taken no chances and the absolute accuracy with which his instructions were fulfilled was simply the logical result of his care i saw the invoice and took note of it fifty cases of common earth to be used for experimental purposes also the copy of the letter to carter patterson in their reply of both these i got copies this was all the information mr billington could give me so i went down to the port and saw the coast guards the customs officers and the harbour master who kindly put me in communication with the men who had actually received the boxes their tally was exact with the list and they had nothing to add to the simple description fifty cases of common earth except that the boxes were main and mortal heavy and that shifting them was dry work one of them added that it was hard lines that there wasn't any gentleman such as like yourself squire to show some sort of appreciation of their efforts in a liquid form another put me in a rider that the thirst then generated was such that even the time which had elapsed had not completely allayed it needless to add i took care before leaving to lift forever and adequately this source of reproach thirty september the station-master was good enough to give me a line to his old companion the station-master at king's cross so that when i arrived there in the morning i was able to ask him about the arrival of the boxes he too put me at once in communication with the proper officials and i saw that their tally was correct with the original invoice the opportunities of acquiring an abnormal thirst had been here limited a noble use of them however had been made and again i was compelled to deal with the result in ex post facto manner from thence i went to carter patterson's central office where i met with the utmost courtesy they looked up the transaction in their day-book and letter-book and at once telephoned to their king's cross office for more details by good fortune the men who did the teaming were waiting for work and the official at once sent them over sending also by one of them the way-bill and all the papers connected with the delivery of the boxes at carfax here again i found the tally agreeing exactly the carrier's men were able to supplement the paucity of the written word with a few more details these were i shortly found connected almost solely with the dusty nature of the job and the consequent thirst engendered in the operators on my affording an opportunity through the medium of the currency of the realm of the allaying at a later period this beneficial evil one of the men remarked that ere house governor is the rummiest i ever was in blimey but it ain't been touched this hundred years there was dust that thick in the place you might have slept on it without hurting of your bones and the place was that neglected that you might have smelled old jerusalem in it but the old chapel <laughs> that took the kike that did me and my mate we thought we'd never get out quick enough nor i wouldn't take less nor a quid a moment to stay there out of dark having been in the house i could well believe him but if he knew what i know he would i think have raised his terms of one thing i am now satisfied that all those boxes which arrived at whitby from varna in the demeter were safely deposited in the old chapel at carfax there should be fifty of them there unless any have since been removed as from dr seward's diary i fear
later mina and i have worked all day and we have put all the papers into order mina harker's journal thirtieth september i am so glad that i hardly know how to contain myself it is i suppose the reaction from the haunting fear which i have had that this terrible affair and the reopening of his old wound might act detrimentally on jonathan i saw him leave for whitby with as brave a face as could but i was sick with apprehension the effort has however done him good he was never so resolute never so strong never so full of volcanic energy as at present it is just as that dear good professor van helsing said he is true grit and he improves under strain that would kill a weaker nature he came back full of life and hope and determination we have got everything in order for to-night i feel myself quite wild with excitement i suppose one ought to pity anything so hunted as the count that is just it the thing is not human not even a beast to read dr seward's account of poor lucy's death and what followed is enough to dry up the springs of pity in one's heart later lord godalming and mr morris arrived earlier than we expected dr seward was out on business and had taken jonathan with him so i had to see them it was to me a painful meeting for it brought back all poor dear lucy's hopes of only a few months ago of course they had heard lucy speak of me and it seemed that dr van helsing too had been quite blowing my trumpet as mr morris expressed it poor fellows neither of them is aware that i know all about the proposals they made to lucy they did not quite know what to say or do as they were ignorant of the amount of my knowledge so they had to keep on neutral subjects however i thought the matter over and came to the conclusion that the best thing i could do would be to post them on affairs right up to date i knew from dr seward's diary that they had been at lucy's death her real death and that i need not fear to betray any secret before the time so i told them as well as i could that i had read all the papers and diaries and that my husband and i having typewritten them had just finished putting them in order i gave them each a copy to read in the library when lord godalming got his and turned it over it does make a pretty good pile he said did you write all this mrs harker i nodded and he went on i don't quite see the drift of it but you people are all so good and kind and have been working so earnestly and so energetically that all i can do is to accept your ideas blindfold and try to help you i have had one lesson already in accepting facts that should make a man humble to the last hour of his life besides i know you loved my lucy here he turned away and covered his face with his hands i could hear the tears in his voice mr morris with instinctive delicacy just laid a hand for a moment on his shoulder and then walked quietly out of the room i suppose there is something in a woman's nature that makes a man free to break down before her and express his feelings on the tender or emotional side without feeling it derogatory to his manhood for when lord godalming found himself alone with me he sat down on the sofa and gave way utterly and openly i sat down beside him and took his hand i hope he didn't think it forward of me and that if he ever thinks of it afterwards he never will have such a thought there i wrong him i know he never will he is too true a gentleman i said to him for i could see that his heart was breaking i loved dear lucy and i know what she was to you and what you were to her she and i were like sisters and now she is gone will you not let me be like a sister to you in your trouble i know what sorrows you have had though i cannot measure the depth of them if sympathy and pity can help in your affliction won't you let me be of some little service for lucy's sake in an instant the poor dear fellow was overwhelmed with grief it seemed to me that all that he had been of late suffering in silence found a vent at once he grew quite hysterical and raising his open hands beat his palms together in a perfect agony of grief he stood up and then sat down again and the tears rained down his cheeks i felt an infinite pity for him and opened my arms unthinkingly with a sob he laid his head on my shoulder and cried like a wearied child whilst he shook with emotion we women have something of the mother in us that makes us rise above smaller matters when the mother spirit is invoked i felt this big sorrowing man's head resting on me as though it were that of a baby that some day may lie on my bosom and i stroked his hair as though he were my own child i never thought at the time how strange it all was after a little bit his sobs ceased and he raised himself with an apology 
though he made no disguise of his emotion. He told me that for days and nights past, weary days and sleepless nights, he had been unable to speak with any one, as a man must speak in his time of sorrow. There was no woman whose sympathy could be given to him, or with whom, owing to the terrible circumstance with which his sorrow was surrounded, he could speak freely. "'I know now how I have suffered,' he said, as he dried his eyes, "'but I do not know even yet, and none other can ever know, how much your sweet sympathy has been to me to-day. I shall know better in time, and believe me that, though I am not ungrateful now, my gratitude will grow with my understanding. You will let me be like a brother, will you not, for all our lives, for dear Lucy's sake?' "'For dear Lucy's sake,' I said, as we clasped hands. "'Aye, and for your own sake,' he added. "'For if a man's esteem and gratitude are ever worth the winning, you have won mine to-day. If ever the future should bring you to a time when you need a man's help, believe me you will not call in vain. God grant that no such time may ever come to you to break the sunshine of your life, but if it should ever come, promise me that you will let me know.' He was so earnest, and his sorrow was so fresh that I felt it would comfort him, so I said, I promise. As I came along the corridor, I saw Mr. Morris looking out of a window. He turned as he heard my footsteps. "'How is art?' he said. Then, noticing my red eyes, he went on, "'Ah, I see you have been comforting him. Poor old fellow! He needs it. No one but a woman can help a man when he is in trouble of the heart, and he had no one to comfort him.' He bore his own trouble so bravely that my heart bled for him. I saw the manuscript in his hand, and I knew that when he read it he would realize how much I knew. So I said to him, I wish I could comfort all who suffer from the heart. Will you let me be your friend, and will you come to me for comfort if you need it? You will know later why I speak." He saw that I was in earnest, and stooping took my hand and raising it to his lips, kissed it. It seemed but poor comfort to so brave and unselfish a soul, and impulsively I bent over and kissed him. The tears rose in his eyes, and there was a momentary choking in his throat. He said quite calmly, "'Little girl, you will never forget that true-hearted kindness, so long as ever you live.' Then he went into the study to his friend. "'Little girl!' The very words he had used to Lucy, and oh, but he proved himself a friend. End of chapter 17 Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 18 Dr. Seward's Diary 30 September I got home at five o'clock and found that Godalming and Morris had not only arrived, but had already studied the manuscript of the various diaries and letters, while Harker had not yet returned from his visit to the carrier's men, of whom Dr. Hennessy had written to me. Mrs. Harker gave us a cup of tea, and I can honestly say that for the first time since I have lived in it, this old house seemed like home. When we had finished, Mrs. Harker said, Dr. Seward, may I ask a favor? I want to see your patient, Mr. Renfield. Do let me see him. What you have said of him in your diary interests me so much. She looked so appealing and so pretty, that I could not refuse her, and there was no possible reason why I should, so I took her with me. When I went into the room, I told the man that a lady would like to see him, to which he simply answered, Why? She is going through the house and wants to see every one in it, I answered. Oh, very well, he said, let her come in, by all means, but... Just wait a minute till I tidy up the place. His method of tidying was peculiar. He simply swallowed all the flies and spiders in the boxes before I could stop him. It was quite evident that he feared or was jealous of some interference. When he had got through his disgusting task, he said cheerfully, Let the lady come in and sat down on the edge of his bed, with his head down, but with his eyelids raised, so that he could see her as she entered. For a moment I thought he might have some homicidal intent. 
I remembered how quiet he had been just before he attacked me in my own study, and I took care to stand where I could seize him at once, if he attempted to make a spring at her. She came into the room with an easy gracefulness, which would at once command the respect of any lunatic, for easiness is one of the qualities mad people most respect. She walked over to him, smiling pleasantly, and held out her hand. "'Good evening, Mr. Renfield,' said she. "'You see, I know you, for Dr. Seward has told me of you.' He made no immediate reply, but eyed her all over intently with a set frown on his face. This look gave way to one of wonder, which merged in doubt. Then, to my intense astonishment, he said, "'You're not the girl the doctor wanted to marry, are you? You can't be, you know, for she's dead.' Mrs. Harker smiled sweetly as she replied, "'Oh, no, I have a husband of my own, to whom I was married before I ever saw Dr. Seward, or he me. I am Mrs. Harker.' "'Then what are you doing here?' "'My husband and I are staying on a visit with Dr. Seward.' "'Then don't stay. But why not? "'I thought that this style of conversation might not be pleasant to Mrs. Harker "'any more than it was to me, so I joined in. "'How did you know I wanted to marry anyone?' "'His reply was simply contemptuous.' given in a pause in which he turned his eyes from Mrs. Harker to me, instantly turning them back again. What an asinine question! I don't see that at all, Mr. Renfield, said Mrs. Harker, at once championing me. He replied to her with as much courtesy and respect as he had shown contempt to me. You will, of course, understand, Mrs. Harker, that when a man is so loved and honoured as our host is, everything regarding him is of interest in our little community. Dr. Seward is loved not only by his household and his friends, but even by his patients, who, being some of them hardly in a mental equilibrium, are apt to distort causes and effects. Since I myself have been an inmate of a lunatic asylum, I cannot but notice that the sophistic tendencies of some of its inmates lean towards the errors of non causa and ignoratio elenche. I positively opened my eyes at this new development. Here was my own pet lunatic, the most pronounced of his type that I had ever met with, talking elemental philosophy, and with the manner of a polished gentleman. I wondered if it was Miss Harker's presence which had touched some chord in his memory, if this new phase was spontaneous, or in any way due to her unconscious influence, she must have some rare gift or power. We continued to talk for some time, and seeing that he was seemingly quite reasonable, she ventured, looking at me questioningly as she began, to lead him to his favourite topic. I was again astonished, for he addressed himself to the question with the impartiality of the completest sanity. He even took himself as an example when he mentioned certain things. Why, I myself am an instance of a man who had a strange belief. Indeed, it was no wonder that my friends were alarmed, and insisted on my being put under control. I used to fancy that life was a positive and perpetual entity, and that by consuming a multitude of live things, no matter how low in the scale of creation, one might indefinitely prolong life. At times I held the belief so strongly that I actually tried to take human life. The doctor here will bear me out that on one occasion 
I tried to kill him, for the purpose of strengthening my vital powers by the assimilation with my own body of his life through the medium of his blood, relying, of course, upon the scriptural phrase, for the blood is the life, though indeed the vendor of a certain nostrum has vulgarized the truism to the very point of contempt. Isn't that true, doctor? I nodded assent, for I was so amazed that I hardly knew what to either think or say. It was hard to imagine that I had seen him eat up his spiders and flies, not five minutes before. Looking at my watch, I saw that I should go to the station to meet Van Helsing, so I told Mrs. Harker that it was time to leave. She came at once, after saying pleasantly to Mr. Renfield, "'Good-bye, and I hope I may see you often, under auspices pleasanter to yourself.' To which, to my astonishment, he replied, "'Good-bye, my dear. I pray, God, I may never see your sweet face again. May he bless and keep you.' When I went to the station to meet Van Helsing, I left the boys behind me. Poor Art seemed more cheerful than he has been since Lucy first took ill, and Quincy is more like his own bright self than he has been for many a long day. Van Helsing stepped from the carriage with the eager nimbleness of a boy. He saw me at once and rushed up to me, saying, "'Ah, friend John!' How goes all? Well, so, I have been busy, for I come here to stay if need be. All affairs are settled with me, and I have much to tell. Madame Mina is with you? Yes, and her so fine husband. And Arthur and my friend Quincy, they are with you too? Good. As I drove to the house, I told him of what had passed, and of how my own diary had come to be of some use through Mrs. Harker's suggestion, at which the professor interrupted me. Ah, that wonderful Madame Mina! She has man's brain, a brain that a man should have were he much gifted, and a woman's heart. The good God fashioned her for a purpose, believe me, when he made that so good combination. Friend John, up to now fortune has made that woman of help to us. After to-night she must not have to do with this so terrible affair. It is not good that she run a risk so great. We men are determined, nay, are we not pledged to destroy this monster? But it is no part for a woman, even if she be not harmed, her heart may fail her in so much and so many horrors, and hereafter she may suffer, both in waking from her nerves, and in sleep from her dreams. And besides, she is young woman, and not so long married. There may be other things to think of some time, if not now. You tell me she has wrote all, then she must consult with us, but to-morrow she say good-bye to this work, and we go alone. I heartily agreed with him, and then I told him what we had found in his absence, that the house which Dracula had bought was the very next one to my own. He was amazed, and a great concern seemed to come on him. Go! Oh, that we had known it before, he said, for then we might have reached him in time to save poor Lucy. However, the milk that is spilt cries not out afterwards, as you say. We shall not think of that, but go on our way to the end. Then he fell into a silence that lasted till we entered my own gateway, before we went to prepare for dinner, he said to Mrs. Harker, I am told, Madam Mina, by my friend John, that you and your husband have put up in exact order all things that have been up 
to this moment. Not up to this moment, Professor, she said impulsively, but up to this morning. But why not up to now? We have seen hitherto how good light all the little things have made. We have told our secrets, and yet no one who has told is the worst for it. Mrs. Harker began to blush, and taking a paper from her pockets, she said, Dr. Van Helsing, will you read this, and tell me if it must go in? It is my record of to-day. I, too, have seen the need of putting down at present everything, however trivial, but there is little in this except what is personal. Must it go in? The professor read it over gravely, and handed it back, saying, It need not go in if you do not wish it, but I pray that it may. It can but make your husband love you more, and all us your friends more honour you, as well as more esteem and love. She took it back with another blush, and a bright smile. And so, up to this very hour, all the records we have are complete and in order. The professor took away one copy to study after dinner, and before our meeting, which is fixed for nine o'clock. The rest of us have already read everything, so when we meet in the study, we shall all be informed as to facts, and can arrange our plan of battle with this terrible and mysterious enemy. Mina Harker's Journal 30th September When we met in Dr. Seward's study two hours after dinner, which had been at six o'clock, we unconsciously formed a sort of board or committee. Professor Van Helsing took the head of the table, to which Dr. Seward motioned him as he came into the room. He made me sit next to him on his right, and asked me to act as secretary. Jonathan sat next to me. Opposite us were Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, and Mr. Morris, Lord Godalming being next to the Professor, and Dr. Seward in the centre. The Professor said, "'I may, I suppose, take it that we are all acquainted with the facts that are in these papers?' We all expressed assent, and he went on. "'Then it were, I think, good that I tell you something of the kind of enemy with which we have to deal. I shall then make known to you something of the history of this man, which has been ascertained for me. So we then can discuss how we shall act.' and can take our measure according. There are such beings as vampires. Some of us have evidence that they exist. Even had we not the proof of our own unhappy experience, the teachings and the records of the past give proof enough for sane peoples. I admit that at the first I was sceptic. Were it not that through long years I have trained myself to keep an open mind, I could not have believed until such time as that fact thunder on my ear. See, see, I prove, I prove! Alas! had I known at first what I know now, nay, had I even guessed at him, one so precious life had been spared to many of us who did love her. But that is gone, and we must so work that other poor souls perish not whilst we can save. The Nosferatu do not die like the bee when he sting once. He is only stronger, and being stronger have yet more power to work evil. This vampire which is amongst us is of himself so strong in person as twenty men. He is of cunning more than mortal for his cunning be the growth of ages. He have still the aids of necromancy, which is, as his etymology imply, the divination by the dead, and all the dead that he can come nigh to are for him at command. He is brute, and more than brute. He is devil and callous, and the heart of him is not. He can, within his range, direct the elements, the storm, the fog, the thunder. He can command all the meaner things, the rat, the owl, the bat, the moth, the fox, and the wolf, he can grow and become small, and he can at times vanish and come unknown. How, then, are we to begin our strike to destroy him? How shall we find his where, and having found it, how can we destroy? My friends, this is much. It is a terrible task that we undertake, and there may be consequence to make the brave shudder. For if we fail in this our fight, he must surely win, and then where end we? Life is nothing, I heed him not, but to fail here is not mere life or death. It is that we become as him, that we henceforward become foul things of the night like him, without heart or conscience, preying on the bodies and the souls of those we love best. To us forever are the gates of heaven shut, for who shall open them to us again? 
We go on for all time, a board by all, a blot on the face of God's sunshine, an arrow in the side of him who died for man. But we are face to face with duty, and in such case, must we shrink? For me I say no, but then I am old, and life with his sunshine, his fair places, his song of birds, his music and his love lie far behind. You others are young. Some have seen sorrow, but there are fair days yet in store. What say you?" Whilst he was speaking, Jonathan had taken my hand. I feared, oh, so much, that the appalling nature of our danger was overcoming him, when I saw his hand stretch out. But it was life to me to feel its touch, so strong, so self-reliant, so resolute. A brave man's hand can speak for itself. It does not even need a woman's love to hear its music. When the professor had done speaking, my husband looked in my eyes, and I in his. There was no need for speaking between us. "'I answer for Mina and myself,' he said. "'Count me in, professor,' said Mr. Quincy Morris, laconically as usual. "'I am with you,' said Lord Godalming, "'for Lucy's sake, if for no other reason.' Dr. Seward simply nodded. The professor stood up and after laying his golden crucifix on the table, held out his hand on either side. I took his right hand, and Lord Godalming his left. Jonathan held my right with his left, and stretched across to Mr. Morris. So as we all took hands, our solemn compact was made. I felt my heart icy cold, but it did not even occur to me to draw back. We resumed our places, and Dr. Van Helsing went on with a sort of cheerfulness which showed that the serious work had begun. It was to be taken as gravely, and in as business-like a way, as any other transaction of life. "'Well, you know what we have to contend against. But we two are not without strength. We have on our side power of combination, a power denied to the vampire kind. We have sources of science. We are free to act and think, and the hours of the day and the night are ours equally. In fact, so far as our powers extend, they are unfettered, and we are free to use them. We have self-devotion in a cause and an end to achieve which is not a selfish one. These things are much. Now, let us see how far the general powers arrayed against us are restrict, and how the individual cannot. In fine, let us consider the limitations of the vampire in general, and of this one in particular. All we have to go upon are traditions and superstitions. These do not at the first appear much when the matter is one of life and death, nay, of more than either life or death. Yet must we be satisfied in the first place because we have to be, no other means is at our control, and secondly, because after all these things, tradition and superstition are everything. Does not the belief in vampires rest for others, though not alas for us, on them? A year ago which of us would have received such a possibility, in the midst of our scientific, sceptical, matter-of-fact nineteenth century? We even scouted a belief that we saw justified under our very eyes. Take it, then, that the vampire— and the belief in his limitations and his cure, rest for the moment on the same base. For, let me tell you, he is known everywhere that man have been. In old Greece, in old Rome, he flourish in Germany all over, in France, in India, even in the Shermer Seas, and in China, so far from us in all ways. There even is he, and the peoples for him at this day. He have followed the wake of the berserker Icelander, the devil-begotten Hun the Slav, the Saxon, the Magyar. So far, then, we have all we may act upon, and let me tell you that very much of the beliefs are justified by what we have seen in our own so unhappy experience. The vampire live on, and cannot die by mere passing of the time. He can flourish when that he can fatten on the blood of the living. Even more, we have seen amongst us that he can grow even younger, that his vital faculties grow strenuous and seem as though they refresh themselves when his special pabulum is plenty. But he cannot flourish without this diet. He eat not as others. Even friend Jonathan, who lived with him for weeks, did not ever see him eat, never. He throws no shadow. He make in the mirror no reflect, as again Jonathan observe. He has the strength of many of his hand. Witness again Jonathan when he shut the door against the wolves, and when he help him from the diligence too. He can transform himself to wolf, as we gather from the ship arrival in Whitby, when he tear open the dog. He can be as bat, as Madame Mina saw him on the window at Whitby, and as friend John saw him fly from this so near house, and as my friend Quincy saw him at the window of Miss Lucy. He can come in mist which he create—that noble ship's captain proved him of this. 
But, from what we know, the distance he can make this mist is limited, and it can only be round himself. He come on moonlight rays as elemental dust, as again Jonathan saw those sisters in the castle of Dracula. He become so small we ourselves saw Miss Lucy, ere she was at peace, slip through a hair's breadth spate at the tomb's door. He can, when once he find his way, come out from anything or into anything, no matter how close it be bound or even fused up with fire, solder, you call it. He can see in the dark, no small power this, in a world which is one half shut from the light. Ah, but hear me through. He can do all these things, yet he is not free. Nay, he is even more prisoner than the slave of the galley, than the madman in his cell. He cannot go where he lists. He who is not of nature has yet to obey some of nature's laws. Why, we know not. He may not enter anywhere at the first, unless there be some one of the household who bid him to come, though afterwards he can come as he please. His power ceases, as does that of all evil things, at the coming of the day. Only at certain times can he have limited freedom. If he be not at the place whither he is bound, he can only change himself at noon, or at exact sunrise or sunset. These things we are told, and in this record of ours we have proof by inference. Thus, whereas he can do as he will within his limit, when he have his earth-home, his coffin-home, his hell-home, the place unhallowed, as we saw when he went to the grave of the suicide at Whitby, still at other time he can only change when the time come. It is said, too, that he can only pass running water at the slack, or the flood of the tide. Then there are things which so afflict him that he has no power, as the garlic that we know of. And as for things sacred, as this symbol, my crucifix, that was amongst us even now when we resolve. To them he is nothing, but in their presence he take his place far off and silent with respect. There are others, too, which I shall tell you of, lest in our seeking we may need them. The branch of wild rose on his coffin keep him that he move not from it. A sacred bullet fired into the coffin kill him, so that he may be true dead. And as for the stake through him, we know already of its peace, or the cut-off head that giveth rest. We have seen it with our eyes. Thus, when we find the habitation of this man that was, we can confine him to his coffin and destroy him, if we obey what we know. But he is clever. I have asked my friend Arminius, of Budapest University, to make his record, and from all the means that are, he tell me of what he has been. He must, indeed, have been that Voivoda Dracula who won his name against the Turk, over the great river on the very frontier of Turkeyland. If it be so, then he was no common man. For in that time, and for centuries after, he was spoken of as the cleverest and the most cunning, as well as the bravest of the sons of the land beyond the forest. That mighty brain and that iron resolution went with him to his grave, and are even now arrayed against us. The Draculas were, says Arminius, a great and noble race, though now and again were scions who were held by the Coevals to have dealings with the evil one. They learned his secrets in the Scholomance, amongst the mountains over Lake Hermannstadt, where the devil claims the tenth scholar is his due. In the records there are words such as Stregoica, Witch, Ordog, and Pokol, Satan, and Hell, and in one manuscript this very Dracula is spoken of as Wampir, which we all understand too well. There have been from the loins of this very one great man, and good women, and their graves make sacred the earth where alone this foulness can dwell. For it is not the least of its terrors that this evil thing is rooted deep in all good. In soil barren of holy memories it cannot rest." Whilst they were talking, Mr. Morris was looking steadily at the window, and he now got up quietly, and went out of the room. There was a little pause, and then the professor went on. "'And now we must settle what we do. We have here much data, and we must proceed to lay out our campaign. We know from the inquiry of Jonathan that from the castle to Whitby came fifty boxes of earth, all of which were delivered at Carfax. We also know that at least some of these boxes have been removed. It seems to me that our first step should be to ascertain whether all the rest remain in the house beyond that wall where we look to-day, or whether any more have been removed. If the latter, we must trace—' Here we were interrupted in a very startling way. Outside the house came the sound of a pistol-shot. The glass of the window was shattered with a bullet, which ricocheting from the top of the embrasure struck the far wall of the room. I am afraid I am at heart a coward, for I shrieked out. The men all jumped to their feet. Lord Godalming flew over to the window and threw up the sash. As he did so, we heard Mr. Morris's voice without. "'Sorry. I fear I have alarmed you. I shall come in and tell you about it.' 
A minute later he came in and said, "'It was an idiotic thing of me to do, and I ask your pardon, Mrs. Harker, most sincerely. I fear I must have frightened you terribly. But the fact is that whilst the professor was talking there came a big bat and sat on the window-sill. I have got such a horror of the damn brutes from recent events that I cannot stand them, and I went out to have a shot, as I have been doing late of evenings, whenever I have seen one. You used to laugh at me for it then, Art.' "'Did you hit it?' asked Dr. Van Helsing. "'I don't know. I fancy not, for it flew away into the wood.' Without saying any more, he took his seat, and the professor began to resume his statement. "'We must trace each of these boxes, and when we are ready, we must either capture or kill this monster in his lair. Or we must, so to speak, sterilize the earth, so that no more he can seek safety in it. Thus, in the end, we may find him in his form of man between the hours of noon and sunset, and so engage with him when he is at his most weak. And now for you, Madame Mina, this night is the end, until all be well. You are too precious to us to have such a risk. When we part to-night, you no more must question. We shall tell you all in good time. We are men, and are able to bear, but you must be our star and our hope, and we shall act all the more free that you are not in the danger, such as we are." All the men, even Jonathan, seemed relieved. But it did not seem to me good that they should brave danger, and perhaps lessen their safety, strength being the best safety, through care of me. But their minds were made up, and though it were a bitter pill for me to swallow, I could say nothing, save to accept their chivalrous care of me. Mr. Morris resumed the discussion. "'As there is no time to lose, I vote we have a look at his house right now. Time is everything with him, and swift action on our part may save another victim.' I own that my heart began to fail me when the time for action came so close, but I did not say anything, for I had a greater fear that if I appeared as a drag or a hindrance to their work, they might even leave me out of their counsels altogether. They have now gone off to Carfax, with means to get into the house. Manlike, they had told me to go to bed and sleep. As if a woman can sleep when those she loves are in danger! I shall lie down and pretend to sleep lest Jonathan have added anxiety about me when he returns. Dr. Seward's Diary 1 October, 4 a.m. Just as we were about to leave the house, an urgent message was brought to me from Renfield to know if I would see him at once, as he had something of the utmost importance to say to me. I told the messenger to say that I would attend to his wishes in the morning. I was busy just at the moment. The attendant added, He seems very importunate, sir. I have never seen him so eager. I don't know, but what, if you don't see him soon, he will have one of his violent fits. I knew the man would not have said this without some cause. So I said, All right, I'll go now and I asked the others to wait a few minutes for me, as I had to go and see my patient. "'Take me with you, friend John,' said the professor. "'His case in your diary interests me much, and it had bearing, too, now and again on our case. I should much like to see him, and especial when his mind is disturbed.' "'May I come also?' asked Lord Galdamin. "'Me, too,' said Quincy Morris. "'May I come?' said Harker. I nodded, and we all went down the passage together. We found him in a state of considerable excitement, but far more rational in his speech and manner than I had ever seen him. There was an unusual understanding of himself, which was unlike anything I had ever met with in a lunatic, and he took it for granted that his reasons would prevail with others entirely sane. We all five went into the room, but none of the others, at first, said anything. His request was that I would at once release him from the asylum and send him home. Then he backed up with arguments regarding his complete recovery and deduced his own existing sanity. I appeal to your friends, he said. They will perhaps not mind sitting in judgment on my case. By the way, you have not introduced me. I was so much astonished that the oddness of introducing a madman in an asylum 
did not strike me at the moment, and, besides, there was a certain dignity in the man's manner, so much of the habit of equality, that I at once made the introduction. Lord Godalming, Professor Van Helsing, Mr. Quincy Morris of Texas, Mr. Jonathan Harker, Mr. Renfield. He shook hands with each of them, saying in turn, Lord Godalming, I had the honour of seconding your father at the Wyndham. I grieve to know, by your holding the title, that he is no more. He was a man loved and honoured by all who knew him, and in his youth was, I have heard, the inventor of a burnt rum punch, much patronised on Derby Night. Mr. Morris, you should be proud of your great state. Its reception into the Union was a precedent which may have far-reaching effects hereafter, when the Pole and the Tropics may hold allegiance to the Stars and Stripes. The power of treaty may yet prove a vast engine of enlargement, when the Monroe Doctrine takes its true place as a political fable. What shall any man say of his pleasure at meeting Van Helsing? Sir, I make no apology for dropping all forms of conventional prefix. When an individual has revolutionized therapeutics by his discovery of the continuous evolution of brain matter, conventional forms are unfitting, since they would seem to limit him to one of a class. You, gentlemen, who by nationality, by heredity, or by the possession of natural gifts, are fitted to hold your respective places in the moving world, I take to witness that I am as sane as at least the majority of men who are in full possession of their liberties, and I am sure that you, Dr. Seward, humanitarian and medico jurist, as well as scientist, will deem it a moral duty to deal with me as one to be considered as under exceptional circumstances. He made this last appeal with a courtly air of conviction, which was not without its own charm. I think we were all staggered. For my own part, I was under the conviction, despite my knowledge of the man's character and history, that his reason had been restored, and I felt under a strong impulse to tell him that I was satisfied as to his sanity, and would see about the necessary formalities for his release in the morning. I thought it better to wait, however, before making so grave a statement, for of old I knew the sudden changes to which this particular patient was liable. So I contented myself with making a general statement that he appeared to be improving very rapidly, that I would have a longer chat with him in the morning, and would then see what I could do in the direction of meeting his wishes. This did not at all satisfy him, for he said quickly, But I fear, Dr. Seward, that you hardly apprehend my wish. I desire to go at once, here, now, this very hour, this very moment, if I may. Time presses, and in our implied agreement with the old scythe man, it is of the essence of the contract. I am sure it is only necessary to put before so admirable a practitioner as Dr. Seward so simple, yet so momentous a wish to ensure its fulfillment. He looked at me keenly, and seeing the negative in my face, turned to the others, and scrutinized them closely. Not meeting any sufficient response, he went on, is it possible that I have erred in my supposition? You have, I said frankly, but at the same time, as I felt, brutally. 
There was a considerable pause, and then he said slowly, Then I suppose I must only shift my ground of request. Let me ask for this concession. Boon. Privilege, what you will. I am content to implore, in such a case, not on personal grounds, but for the sake of others. I am not at liberty to give you the whole of my reasons, but you may, I assure you, take it from me that they are good ones, sound and unselfish, and spring from the highest sense of duty. Could you look, sir, into my heart, you would approve to the full the sentiments which animate me. Nay, more, you would count me amongst the best and truest of your friends. Again, he looked at us all keenly. I had a growing conviction that this sudden change of his entire intellectual method was but yet another phase of his madness, and so determined to let him go on a little longer, knowing from experience that he would, like all lunatics, give himself away in the end. Van Helsing was gazing at him with a look of utmost intensity, his bushy eyebrows almost meeting with the fixed concentration of his look. He said to Renfield, in a tone which did not surprise me at the time, but only when I thought of it afterwards, for it was as of one addressing an equal. Can you not tell frankly your real reason for wishing to be free to-night? I will undertake that, if you will satisfy even me, a stranger, without prejudice, and with the habit of keeping an opened mind, Dr. Seward will give you, at his own risk, and on his own responsibility, the privilege you seek. He shook his head sadly, and with a look of poignant regret on his face. The professor went on. Come, sir, bethink yourself. You claim the privilege of reason in the highest degree, since you seek to impress us with your complete reasonableness. You do this, whose sanity we have reason to doubt, since you are not yet released from medical treatment for this very defect. If you will not help us in our effort to choose the wisest course, how can we perform the duty which you yourself put upon us? Be wise, and help us, and if we can, we shall aid you to achieve your wish. He still shook his head as he said, Dr. Van Helsing, I have nothing to say. Your argument is complete, and if I were free to speak, I should not hesitate a moment. But I am not my own master in the matter. I can only ask you to trust me. If I am refused, the responsibility does not rest with me. I thought it was now time to end the scene, which was becoming too comically grave, so I went towards the door, simply saying, Come, my friends, we have work to do. Good night. As, however, I got near the door, a new change came over the patient. He moved towards me so quickly that for the moment I feared that he was about to make another homicidal attack. My fears, however, were groundless, for he held up his two hands imploringly and made his petition in a moving manner. As he saw that the very excess of his emotion was militating against him, by restoring us more to our old relations, he became still more demonstrative. I glanced at Van Helsing, and saw my conviction reflected in his eyes, so I became a little more fixed in my manner, if not more stern, and motioned to him that his efforts were unavailing. 
I had previously seen something of the same constantly growing excitement in him when he had to make some request, of which, at the time, he had thought much, such as, for instance, as when he wanted a cat, and I was prepared to see the collapse into the same sullen acquiescence on this occasion. My expectation was not realized, for when he found that his appeal would not be successful, he got into quite a frantic condition. He threw himself on his knees, and held up his hands, wringing them in plaintive supplication, and poured forth a torrent of entreaty, with the tears rolling down his cheeks, and his whole face and form expressive of the deepest emotion. Let me entreat you, Dr. Seward, oh, let me implore you to let me out of this house at once. Send me away how you will and where you will. Send keepers with me with whips and chains. Let them take me in a straight waistcoat, manacled and leg-ironed, even to jail. But let me go out of this. You don't know what you do by keeping me here. I am speaking from the depths of my heart, of my very soul. You don't know whom you wrong, or how, and I may not tell. Woe is me, I may not tell. By all you hold sacred, by all you hold dear, by your love that is lost, by your hope that lives, for the sake of the Almighty, take me out of this and save my soul from guilt. Can't you hear me, man? Can't you understand? Will you never learn? Don't you know that I am sane and earnest now? That I am no lunatic and a mad fit, but a sane man fighting for his soul. Oh, hear me. Hear me. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. I thought that the longer this went on, the wilder he would get, and so would bring on a fit. So I took him by the hand and raised him up. Come, I said sternly, no more of this. We have had quite enough already. Get to your bed and try to behave more discreetly. He suddenly stopped and looked at me intently for several moments. Then, without a word, he rose and, moving over, sat down on the side of the bed. The collapse had come, as on former occasions, just as I had expected. When I was leaving the room, last of our party, he said to me in a quiet, well-bred voice, you will, I trust, Dr. Stewart, do me the justice to bear in mind, later on, that I did what I could to convince you tonight. End of chapter 18 Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 19 Jonathan Harker's Journal 1 October 5 a.m. I went with the party to the search with an easy mind, for I think I never saw Mina so absolutely strong and well. I am so glad that she consented to hold back and let us men do the work. Somehow it was a dread to me that she was in this fearful business at all, but now that her work is done and it is due to her energy and brains and foresight that the whole story is put together in such a way that every point tells— she may well feel that her part is finished, and that she can henceforth leave the rest to us. We were, I think, all a little upset by the scene with Mr. Renfield. When we came away from his room, we were silent till we got back to the study. Then Mr. Morris said to Dr. Seward, "'Say, Jack, if that man wasn't attempting a bluff, he's about the sadest lunatic I ever saw.' I'm not sure, but I believe that he had some serious purpose, and if he had, it was pretty rough on him not to get a chance. 
Lord Godalming and I were silent. But Dr. Van Helsing added, Friend John, you know more lunatics than I do, and I'm glad of it, for I fear that if it had been me to decide, I would before that last hysterical outburst have given him free. But we live and learn, and in our present task we must take no chance, as my friend Quincy would say. All is best as they are. Dr. Seward seemed to answer them both in a dreamy kind of way. I don't know but that I agree with you. If that man had been an ordinary lunatic, I would have taken my chance of trusting him, but he seems so mixed up with the Count in an indexy sort of way that I am afraid of doing anything wrong by helping his fads. I can't forget how he prayed with almost equal fervour for a cat, and then tried to tear my throat out with his teeth. Besides, he called the Count Lord and Master, and he may want to get out to help him in some diabolical way. That horrid thing has the wolves and the rats and his own kind to help him, so I suppose he isn't above trying to use a respectable lunatic. He certainly did seem earnest, though. I only hope we have done what is best. These things in conjunction with the wild work we have in hand help to unnerve a man. The professor stepped over, and laying his hand on his shoulder, said in a grave, kindly way, Friend John, have no fear. We are trying to do our duty in a very sad and terrible case. We can only do as we deem best. What else have we to hope for, except the pity of the good God? Lord Godalming had slipped away for a few minutes, but now he returned. He held up a little silver whistle as he remarked, "'That old place may be full of rats, and if so I've got an antidote on call.' Having passed the wall, we took our way to the house, taking care to keep in the shadows of the trees on the lawn when the moonlight shone out. When we got to the porch, the professor opened his bag and took out a lot of things, which he laid on the step, sorting them into four little groups, evidently one for each. Then he spoke. "'My friends, we are going into a terrible danger, and we need arms of many kinds. Our enemy is not merely spiritual. Remember that he has the strength of twenty men, and that, though our necks or our windpipes are of the common kind and therefore breakable or crushable, his are not amenable to mere strength. A stronger man, or a body of men more strong in all than him, can at certain times hold him, but they cannot hurt him, as we can be hurt by him. We must therefore guard ourselves from his touch. Keep this near your heart. As he spoke, he lifted a little silver crucifix and held it out to me, I being nearest to him. Put these flowers round your neck. Here he handed me a wreath of withered garlic blossoms, for other enemies more mundane, this revolver and this knife, and for aid in all, so small electric lamps which you can fasten to your breast, and for all, and above all, at the last, this which we must not desecrate needless. This was a portion of sacred wafer, which he put in an envelope and handed to me. Each of the others was similarly equipped. Now, he said, friend John, where are the skeleton keys? If so that we can open the door, we need not break house by the window, as before at Miss Lucy's. Dr. Seward tried one or two skeleton keys, his mechanical dexterity as a surgeon standing him in good stead. Presently he got one to suit, after a little play back and forward the bolt yielded, and with a rusty clang shot back. We pressed on the door, the rusty hinges creaked, and it slowly opened. It was startlingly like the image conveyed to me in Dr. Seward's diary of the opening of Miss Westenra's tomb. I fancy that the same idea seemed to strike the others, for with one accord they shrank back. The professor was the first to move forward, and stepped into the open door. "'In manus tuas, domine,' he said, crossing himself, as he passed over the threshold. We closed the door behind us, lest when we should have lit our lamps we should possibly attract attention from the road. The professor carefully tried the lock, lest we might not be able to open it from within should we be in a hurry making our exit. 
Then we all lit our lamps and proceeded on our search. The light from the tiny lamps fell in all sorts of odd forms, as the rays crossed each other or the opacity of our bodies threw great shadows. I could not for my life get away from the feeling that there was someone else amongst us. I suppose it was the recollection so powerfully brought home to me by the grim surroundings of that terrible experience in Transylvania. I think the feeling was common to us all, for I noticed that the others kept looking over their shoulders at every sound and every shadow, just as I felt myself doing. The whole place was thick with dust. The floor was seemingly inches deep, except where there were recent footsteps in which, on holding down my lamp, I could see marks of hobnails where the dust was cracked. The walls were fluffy and heavy with dust, and in the corners were masses of spider's webs, whereon the dust had gathered, till they looked like old tattered rags as the weight had torn them partly down. On the table in the hall was a great bunch of keys, with a time-yellowed label on each. These had been used several times, for on the table were several similar rents in the blanket of dust, similar to that exposed when the professor lifted them. He turned to me and said, "'You know this place, Jonathan. You have copied maps of it, and you know it at least more than we do. Which is the way to the chapel?' I had an idea of its direction, though on my former visit I had not been able to get admission to it, so I led the way, and after a few wrong turnings found myself opposite a low, arched oaken door, ribbed with iron bands. "'This is the spot.' said the professor, as he turned his lamp on a small map of the house, copied from the file of my original correspondence regarding the purchase. With a little trouble we found the key on the bunch and opened the door. We were prepared for some unpleasantness, for as we were opening the door a faint, malodorous air seemed to exhale through the gaps, but none of us ever expected such an odour as we encountered— None of the others had met the Count at all at close quarters, and when I had seen him he was either in the fasting stage of his existence, in his rooms, or, when he was bloated with fresh blood, in a ruined building open to the air. But here the place was small and close, and the long disuse had made the air stagnant and foul. There was an earthy smell, as of some dry miasma, which came through the fouler air. But as to the odour itself, how shall I describe it? It was not alone that it was composed of all the ills of mortality, and with the pungent acrid smell of blood, but it seemed as though corruption had become itself corrupt. For oh, it sickens me to think of it. Every breath exhaled by that monster seemed to have clung to the place and intensified its loathsomeness. Under ordinary circumstances such a stench would have brought our enterprise to an end, but this was no ordinary case, and the high and terrible purpose in which we were involved gave us a strength which rose above merely physical considerations. After the involuntary shrinking consequent on the first nauseous whiff, we one and all set about our work as though that loathsome place were a garden of roses. We made an accurate examination of the place, the professor saying as we began, The first thing is to see how many of the boxes are left. We must then examine every hole and corner and cranny, and see if we cannot get some clue as to what has become of the rest. A glance was sufficient to show how many remained, for the great earth chests were bulky, and there was no mistaking them. There were only twenty-nine left out of the fifty. Once I got a fright, for, seeing Lord Godalming suddenly turn and look out of the vaulted door into the dark passage beyond, I looked too, and for an instant my heart stood still. Somewhere, looking out from the shadow, I seemed to see the highlights of the Count's evil face, the ridge of the nose, the red eyes, the red lips, the awful pallor. It was only for a moment, for, as Lord Godalming said, I thought I saw a face, but it was only the shadows, and resumed his inquiry. I turned my lamp in the direction, and stepped into the passage. 
there was no sign of any one, and as there were no corners, no doors, no aperture of any kind, but only the solid walls of the passage, there could be no hiding-place even for him. I took it that fear had helped imagination and said nothing. A few minutes later I saw Morris step suddenly back from a corner which he was examining. We all followed his movements with our eyes, for undoubtedly some nervousness was growing on us, and we saw a whole mass of phosphorescence which twinkled like stars. We all instinctively drew back. The whole place was becoming alive with rats. For a moment or two we all stood appalled, all save Lord Godalming, who was seemingly prepared for such an emergency. Rushing over to the great iron-bound oaken door which Dr. Seward had described from the outside, and which I had seen myself, he turned the key in the lock, drew the huge bolts, and swung the door open. Then, taking his little silver whistle from his pocket, he blew a low, shrill call. It was answered from behind Dr. Seward's house by the yelping of dogs, and after about a minute three terriers came dashing round the corner of the house. Unconsciously we had all moved towards the door, and as we moved I noticed that the dust had been much disturbed. The boxes which had been taken out had been brought this way, but even in the minute that had elapsed the number of the rats had vastly increased. They seemed to swarm over the place all at once, till the lamplight shining on their moving dark bodies and glittering baleful eyes made the place look like a bank of earth set with fireflies. The dogs dashed on, but at the threshold suddenly stopped and snarled, and then, simultaneously lifting their noses, began to howl in a most lugubrious fashion. The rats were multiplying in thousands, and we moved out. Lord Godalming lifted one of the dogs, and, carrying him in, placed him on the floor. The instant his feet touched the ground he seemed to recover his courage and rushed at his natural enemies. They fled before him so fast that, before he had shaken the life out of a score, the other dogs, who had by now been lifted in the same manner, had but small prey ere the whole mass had vanished. With their going it seemed as if some evil presence had departed, for the dogs frisked about and barked merrily as they made sudden darts at their prostrate foes, and turned them over and tossed them in the air with vicious shakes. We all seemed to find our spirits rise. Whether it was the purifying of the deadly atmosphere by the opening of the chapel door, or the relief which we experienced by finding ourselves in the open I know not, but most certainly the shadow of dread seemed to slip from us like a robe, and the occasion of our coming lost something of its grim significance, though we did not slacken a whit in our resolution. We closed the outer door, and barred and locked it, and, bringing the dogs with us, began our search of the house. We found nothing throughout, except dust in extraordinary proportions, and all untouched, save for my own footsteps, when I had made my first visit. Never once did the dogs exhibit any symptom of uneasiness, and even when we returned to the chapel they frisked about as though they had been rabbit-hunting in a summer wood. The morning was quickening in the east when we emerged from the front. Dr. Van Helsing had taken the key of the hall door from the bunch, and locked the door in orthodox fashion, putting the key into his pocket when he had done. "'So far,' he said, "'our night has been eminently successful.' No harm has come to us, such as I feared might be, and yet we have ascertained how many boxes are missing. More than all do I rejoice that this, our first and perhaps our most difficult and dangerous, step has been accomplished without the bringing therein to our most sweet Madame Mina, or troubling her waking or sleeping thoughts with sights and sounds and smells of horror which she might never forget." One lesson, too, we have learned, if it be allowable to argue a particulari, that the brute beasts which are to the Count's command are yet themselves not amenable to his spiritual power. For look, these rats that would come to his call, just as from his castle-top 
he summoned the wolves to your going and to that poor mother's cry though they come to him they run pell-mell from the so little dogs of my friend arthur we have other matters before us other dangers other fears and that monster he has not used his power over the brute world for the only or the last time to-night so be it that he has gone elsewhere good it has given us opportunity to cry check in some ways in this chess game which we play for the sake of human souls and now let us go home the dawn is close at hand and we have reason to be content with our first night's work it may be ordained that we have many nights and days to follow if full of peril but we must go on and from no danger shall we shrink the house was silent when we got back save for some poor creature who was screaming away in one of the distant wards and a low moaning sound from renfield's room the poor wretch was doubtless torturing himself after the manner of the insane with needless thoughts of pain i came tiptoe into our own room and found mina asleep breathing so softly that i had to put my ear down to hear it she looks paler than usual i hope the meeting to-night has not upset her i am truly thankful that she is to be left out of our future work and even of our deliberations it is too great a strain for a woman to bear i did not think so at first but i know better now therefore i am glad that it is settled there may be things which would frighten her to hear and yet to conceal them from her might be worse than to tell her if once she suspected that there was any concealment henceforth our work is to be a sealed book to her till at least such time as we can tell her that all is finished and the earth free from a monster of the nether world i dare say it will be difficult to keep silence after such confidence as ours but i must be resolute and to-morrow i shall keep dark over to-night's doings and shall refuse to speak of anything that has happened i rest on the sofa so as not to disturb her one october later i suppose it was natural that we should have all overslept ourselves for the day was a busy one and the night had no rest at all even mina must have felt its exhaustion for though i slept till the sun was high i was awake before her and had to call two or three times before she awoke indeed she was so sound asleep that for a few seconds she did not recognize me but looked at me with a sort of blank terror as one looks who has been waked out of a bad dream she complained a little of being tired and i let her rest till later in the day we now know of twenty-one boxes having been removed and if it be that several were taken to any of these removals we may be able to trace them all such will of course immensely simplify our labour and the sooner the matter is attended to the better i shall look up thomas snelling to-day dr seward's diary one october it was towards noon when i was awakened by the professor walking into my room he was more jolly and cheerful than usual and it is quite evident that last night's work has helped to take some of the brooding weight off his mind after going over the adventure of the night he suddenly said your patient interests me much may it be that with you i visit him this morning or if that you are to occupy i can go alone if it may be it is a new experience to me to find a lunatic who talk philosophy and reason so sound i had some work to do which pressed so i told him that if he would go alone i would be glad as then i should not have to keep him waiting so i called an attendant and gave him the necessary instructions before the professor left the room i cautioned him against getting any false impression from my patient but he answered i want him to talk of himself and of his delusion as to consuming live things he said to madame mina as i see in your diary of yesterday 
that he had once had such a belief. Why do you smile, friend John? Excuse me, I said, but the answer is here. I laid my hand on the typewritten matter. When our sane and learned lunatic made that very statement of how he used to consume life, his mouth was actually nauseous with the flies and spiders which he had eaten just before Mrs. Harker entered the room. Van Helsing smiled in turn. Good, he said. Your memory is true, friend John. I should have remembered. And yet it is this very obliquity of thought and memory which makes mental disease such a fascinating study. Perhaps I may gain more knowledge out of the folly of this madman than I shall from the teaching of the most wise. Who knows? I went on with my work, and before long was through that in hand. It seemed that the time had been very short indeed, but there was Van Helsing back in the study. Do I interrupt? he asked politely, as he stood at the door. Not at all, I answered. Come in. My work is finished, and I am free. I can go with you now, if you like. It is needless. I have seen him. Well, I fear that he does not appraise me at much. Our interview was short. When I entered his room he was sitting on a stool, in the centre, with his elbows on his knees, and his face was the picture of sullen discontent. I spoke to him as cheerfully as I could, and with such a measure of respect as I could assume. He made no reply whatever. "'Don't you know me?' I asked. His answer was not reassuring. "'I know you well enough. You are the old fool Van Helsing. I wish you would take yourself and your idiotic brain theories somewhere else. Damn all thick-headed Dutchmen! Not a word more, would he say, but sat in his implacable sullenness, as indifferent to me as though I had not been in the room at all. Thus departed for this time my chance of much learning from this so clever lunatic, so I shall go, if I may, and cheer myself with a few happy words with that sweet soul, Madame Mina. Friend John, it does rejoice me unspeakable that she is no more to be pained, no more to be worried with our terrible things, though we shall much miss her help. It is better so. I agree with you with all my heart, I answered earnestly, for I did not want him to weaken in this matter. Mrs. Harker is better out of it. Things are quite bad enough for us, all men of the world, and who have been in many tight places in our time. But it is no place for a woman, and if she had remained in touch with the affair, it would in time infallibly have wrecked her. So Van Helsing was gone to confer with Mrs. Harker and Harker, Quincy and Art are all out following up the clues as to the earth boxes. I shall finish my round of work, and we shall meet to-night. Mina Harker's Journal 1st October It is strange to me to be kept in the dark as I am to-day, after Jonathan's full confidence for so many years, to see him manifestly avoid certain matters, and those the most vital of all. This morning I slept late after the fatigues of yesterday, and though Jonathan was late too, he was the earlier. He spoke to me before he went out, never more sweetly or tenderly, but he never mentioned a word of what had happened in the visit to the Count's house, and yet he must have known how terribly anxious I was. Poor dear fellow! I suppose it must have distressed him even more than it did me. They all agreed that it was best that I should not be drawn further into this awful work, and I acquiesced. But to think that he keeps anything from me! Now I am crying like a silly fool, when I know it comes from my husband's great love, and from the good, good wishes of those other strong men. That has done me good. 
Well, some day Jonathan will tell me all. And lest it should ever be that he should think for a moment that I kept anything from him, I still keep my journal as usual. Then, if he has feared of my trust, I shall show it to him, with every thought of my heart put down for his dear eyes to read. I feel strangely sad and low-spirited to-day. I suppose it is the reaction from the terrible excitement. Last night I went to bed when the men had gone, simply because they told me to. I didn't feel sleepy, and I did feel full of devouring anxiety. I kept thinking over everything that has been ever since Jonathan came to see me in London, and it all seems like a horrible tragedy, with fate pressing on relentlessly to some destined end. Everything that one does seems, no matter how right it may be, to bring on the very thing which is most to be deplored. If I hadn't gone to Whitby, perhaps poor dear Lucy would be with us now. She hadn't taken to visiting the churchyard till I came, and if she hadn't come there in the daytime with me she wouldn't have walked in her sleep, and if she hadn't gone there at night in her sleep the monster couldn't have destroyed her as he did. Oh, why did I ever go to Whitby? <laughs> there now, crying again. I wonder what has come over me to-day. I must hide it from Jonathan for if he knew that I had been crying twice in one morning—I, who never cried on my own account, and whom he has never caused to shed a tear, the poor dear fellow would fret his heart out. I shall put a bold face on, and if I do feel weepy he shall never see it. I suppose it is just one of the lessons that we poor women have to learn. I can't quite remember how I fell asleep last night. I remember hearing the sudden barking of the dogs, and a lot of queer sounds like praying on a very tumultuous scale, from Mr. Renfield's room, which is somewhere under this. And then there was silence over everything, silence so profound that it startled me, and I got up and looked out of the window. All was dark and silent, the black shadows thrown by the moonlight seeming full of a silent mystery of their own. Not a thing seemed to be stirring, but all to be grim and fixed as death or fate so that a thin streak of white mist, that crept with almost imperceptible slowness across the grass towards the house, seemed to have a sentience and a vitality of its own. I think that the digression of my thoughts must have done me good, for when I got back to bed I found a lethargy creeping over me. I lay a while, but could not quite sleep, so I got out and looked out of the window again. The mist was spreading, and was now close up to the house so that I could see it lying thick against the wall, as though it was stealing up to the windows. The poor man was more loud than ever, and though I could not distinguish a word he said, I could in some way recognize in his tone some passionate entreaty on his part. Then there was the sound of a struggle, and I knew that the attendants were dealing with him. I was so frightened that I crept into bed, and pulled the clothes over my head, putting my fingers in my ears. I was not then a bit sleepy, at least so I thought, but I must have fallen asleep for except dreams I do not remember anything until the morning when Jonathan woke me. I think that it took me an effort and a little time to realize where I was, and that it was Jonathan who was bending over me. My dream was very peculiar, and was almost typical of the way that waking thoughts become merged in, or continued in dreams. I thought that I was asleep, and waiting for Jonathan to come back. I was very anxious about him, and I was powerless to act. My feet and my hands and my brain were weighted, so that nothing could proceed at the usual pace. And so I slept uneasily, and thought. Then it began to dawn upon me that the air was heavy and dark and cold. I put back the clothes from my face, and found to my surprise that it was dim all around. The gaslight which I had left lit for Jonathan, but turned down, came only like a tiny red spark through the fog, which had evidently grown thicker and poured into the room. Then it occurred to me that I had shut the window before I had come to bed. I would have got out to make certain on the point, but some leaden lethargy seemed to chain my limbs and even my will. I lay still and endured, that was all. I closed my eyes, but could see still through my eyelids. It is wonderful what tricks our dreams play us, and how conveniently we can imagine. The mist grew thicker and thicker, and I could see now how it came in for I could see it like smoke, or with the white energy of boiling water pouring in, not through the window, but through the joinings of the door. It got thicker and thicker, till it seemed as if it became concentrated into a sort of pillar of cloud in the room, through the top of which I could see the light of the gas shining like a red eye. 
things began to whirl through my brain, just as the cloudy column was now whirling in the room, and through it all came the scriptural words, A pillar of cloud by day, and of fire by night. Was it indeed such spiritual guidance that was coming to me in my sleep? But the pillar was composed of both the day and the night guiding, for the fire was in the red eye, which at the thought got a new fascination for me, till as I looked, the fire divided, and seemed to shine on me through the fog like two red eyes, such as Lucy told me of in her momentary mental wandering, when on the cliff the dying sunlight struck the windows of St. Mary's Church. Suddenly, the horror burst upon me that it was thus that Jonathan had seen those awful women growing into reality through the whirling mist in the moonlight, and in my dream I must have fainted, for all became black darkness. The last conscious effort which imagination made was to show me a livid white face bending over me out of the mist. I must be careful of such dreams, for they would unseat one's reason if there were too much of them. I would get Dr. Van Helsing or Dr. Seward to prescribe something for me which would make me sleep, only that I fear to alarm them. Such a dream at the present time would become woven into their fears for me. To-night I shall strive hard to sleep naturally. If I do not, I shall to-morrow night get them to give me a dose of chloral, that cannot hurt me for once, and it will give me a good night's sleep. Last night tired me more than if I had not slept at all. 2nd October, 10 p.m. Last night I slept, but did not dream. I must have slept soundly, for I was not waked by Jonathan coming to bed. But the sleep has not refreshed me, for to-day I feel terribly weak and spiritless. I spent all yesterday trying to read, or lying down, dozing. In the afternoon Mr. Renfield asked if he might see me. Poor man! He was very gentle, and when I came away he kissed my hand and bade God bless me. Some way it affected me much. I am crying when I think of him. This is a new weakness of which I must be careful. Jonathan would be miserable if he knew I had been crying. He and the others were out till dinner-time, and they all came in tired. I did what I could to brighten them up, and I suppose that the effort did me good, for I forgot how tired I was. After dinner they sent me to bed, and all went off to smoke together, as they said, but I knew that they wanted to tell each other of what had occurred to each during the day. I could see from Jonathan's manner that he had something important to communicate. I was not so sleepy as I should have been, so before they went I asked Dr. Seward to give me a little opiate of some kind, as I had not slept well the night before. He very kindly made me up a sleeping draught, which he gave to me, telling me that it would do me no harm, as it was very mild. I have taken it, and am waiting for sleep, which still keeps aloof. I hope I have not done wrong, for as sleep begins to flirt with me, a new fear comes, that I may have been foolish in thus depriving myself of the power of waking. I might want it. Here comes sleep. Good night. End of chapter 19